to another Jags podcast episode number 36 and like the Jaguars who are dropping players left and right due to injury another Jags podcast is down a couple players tonight we've lost Joey and Robert due to health reasons so Jason and I are going to be holding down the fort for the episode on, are they on IR they're on, well, not on IR. They, oh. they, they can, they're like uh, Austin Safari and Jenkins. They're on IR, but they can come back oh, okay. uh, later in the year. Okay. I know. Okay. There, there was some hopefulness in your voice there. Oh, just said, a little bit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> At least towards Joey, for sure. <laughs> so we can, we, obviously, it's an immediate, it, this is kind of an addition by subtraction type episode. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Jason and I are going to be holding down the fort. We're going to be talking uh, who stunk the bed the most. We're going to kind of rank, in our opinions, who is to blame the most for the Jaguars' loss to the Chiefs on Sunday. Whether it be the coaches, the quarterback, the offensive line, the wide receivers, the defense, perhaps, all of that. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about Blake Bortles because he has been discussed a lot in the last 24 hours. Can he be the man? Can he win the Jaguars a Super Bowl? Along with that, uh, we're going to be talking about the now glaring absence of Leonard Fournette, along with Corey Grant, who has gone for the year. And uh, what that means for the Jaguars, this, is the, this week is the trade deadline in the National Football League. Do the Jags make a running back move? And if so, who should it be? And also, who will it be? Uh, Austin Severian Jenkins, like we mentioned, is gone. He's uh, not for the year, but he is on the IR for a little bit. So we might touch on that if we have time. And again, if there's anything good that we can glean from the game on sunday we want to we want to bring some positivity i think there's some i think so as well yeah. uh so we'll, we're going to talk a little bit of positives because listen this is our team this is the jaguars we love them so we're going to get to all that stuff but before we do we want to remind everyone that we are on twitter at another jags pod we are on facebook and instagram at another jags podcast you can go to our website if you dare another jags podcast.com or if you want to go the simple route you can just listen to us on youtube uh, just search another Jags podcast and you'll find our episodes there. We've gotten a lot of really good feedback on Twitter. We appreciate that. Some are questions. Some are just comments. Anyway, listen, we get those and we read them. We, we share them with each other. So we, we just really appreciate that. It's really cool that other fans besides us are interacting with this show because that's all we are fans. And we love uh, hearing from other fans as well. So let's get right into it, Jason. What do you think? I mean, the Jags, I don't, I don't even remember what the final score was. 31 to 14, I think. 30 to 14 is, it's, it's uh, not something, something I'm trying like to dwell that. on. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's play some blame. Who do you fault in this first? Not, 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 obviously, there's plenty of blame to go around. But if you had to pick one player, coach, position group, who would it be? I hate to do this, but I got to put it on Doug Marone. Okay. The decision making from the beginning has been questionable. Marone has had moments where you kind of question like his line of thinking, and and that's okay. And I'm not talking about his like aggressiveness to go for it on fourth down and onside kicks. Like I'm cool with that. It's just I don't feel like he has enough control over the offense. He needs to be more involved in the play calling. And I understand he wants to turn it over to Nathaniel Hackett to make the play calls. And I'm sure Marone isn't making any play calls on offense or defense, but you cannot allow your team to go for it on fourth down with two yards to gain. And you don't run the ball at least once. Like I know this has kind of been overplayed already and a terrible decision, but it's that bad of a decision. That's coaching one Oh one. If you're going to go for it on fourth down and you know, you're going to, you had to have known you're going to, because an incomplete fade route, isn't going to change your mind. So you, they had to have known they were going for the fourth down. Why not try to run it? They were gashing them all game between the tackles. We knew going into this game, that was their weakness. They can't tackle. They can't defend the run. I mean, it was, it was glaringly obvious that that's what they were going to do. And that's what they needed to do. And on fourth and short, third and short, they didn't even try to run it once. Come on. I know you can't pin the whole game on that, but... That's just a horrible, horrible decision, in my opinion. Well, to me, that sequence, those two plays were a microcosm of the entire game. I, I thought the exact same thing. If you are going to go for it on fourth down, you've already made that decision on third down. And so that should affect your play call on third down. And, and to throw a, a fade 
on third and two when I believe it wasn't third and goal. It was third and two. So they didn't even have to score a touchdown. They could have gotten a first down like the one yard line. I think don't quote me on that. It might have been third and goal. I don't remember. It doesn't matter because if, if you know on third down that you're going to go for it on fourth down, if you don't convert on third, why not just run it two times? I'm, 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 I'm sure if they had just let Blake do a quarterback sneak two times in a row, he would have gotten a yard and then another yard. I just can't, I can't imagine that not happening. So the, that was a, a bad play call sequence, in my opinion. Another one was a drive, I believe it was earlier in the game. They threw a you know 38-yard completion to DJ Chark, and that worked out. But then they do, I think it was on the same drive. It they was. throw two deep balls back-to-back to, back to Second drive of the game. Back-to-back back deep balls to Moncrief over the middle. Both fall incomplete, and they have to punt. To, to me, if the best way to stop Kansas City's offense is to keep them on the sideline. The way that you do that is to control the, the ball on offense, convert your third downs, run the ball, run out the clock, control time of possession, and you do that by running. You don't do that by throwing deep balls, which they had never done well all year, and suddenly they're going to decide to do it now. And I understand Corey Grant got hurt early in the game and he was out. So that probably changed some things. He wasn't but, hurt at that point though. No, that he, was the second drive of the game. Yeah, it just, I, I was sitting there going, what are you doing? What are you trying to accomplish? Don't get cute. Why are you trying to get cute now? You know, this team cannot stop the run. We've been having success with the run so far in the game. So just pound it. Keep the, the Kansas city offense on the sidelines and let's control the clock and time of possession and all those things and score. And it just didn't make any sense to me why all of a sudden they were going to start throwing down the middle. In that game of all games, we've been asking them to do that all year, but but then it just it just made no sense to me whatsoever. It looked like they were picking on Nelson, their defensive back for the Chiefs, and they they got him a couple times with Chark. But on that drive you're talking about, it was the second drive of the game, first drive of the game that we had with like good weather, so it was like our first chance at really moving the ball. And the Chiefs had already scored a touchdown at that point. We start the drive off with a six yard run by Yeldon. Then we throw it deep to DJ Chark. He gets it the 30-yard reception. Beautiful play sequence. Then they come back out on the next first down. All right. And now, if you had to guess what the Jags were going to do, let's say you're the Chiefs and you're guessing what, what the Jags are going to do first and 10 after a deep pass to Chark and a successful run, you would guess they're going to run the ball. Mm-hmm. Great idea. So the Jags tried to stay ahead of the, the Chiefs and they went for a play action on that play. The problem was... All of the routes that the receivers ran were deep routes down the field. They had it drawn up perfectly. A play action would have been perfect. They bite on the run, but you got to have short routes on that play. The receivers weren't even looking at Bortles when Bortles was in that. Then he got sacked on that same drive. And like, what do you expect to happen? The receivers weren't even looking. So you got to be smarter than that as a coaching staff to know the other team's expecting you to ground and pound the ball. If you're going to run a play action, you got to have someone running a short route. The only person they had that was short was the running back, and he should have been blocking on that play. So just just bad play calling. Then they tried to go to Moncrief deep twice. Then they punt. It's like, come on. Like that's, that's little league coaching right there. Yeah. You have to be, you're a professional team. You have to kind of look ahead in the future. I put a lot of this on the coaching, but... That, that's where my blame goes. I put it on Marone because he's the head honcho. He's the head CEO of the coaching staff. He takes all the blame for all the coaching decisions on game day. When Blake said in the post-game press conference that they were really unlucky, they really, really were. A lot of things were just bad place at the bad, at the bad time. And you, com- you combine that with poor coaching and you got what you got. Give me an example because there may have been some bad luck, but sometimes bad luck can be created by bad execution. I agree. Okay, so... The play that Bortles threw the pick six on the, the screen route, that was an excellent read by that defensive lineman. Okay. Now, don't get me wrong. I went back and watched that play. Chris Jones was standing on like the 20 yard line. The next defender was on the 30 yard line. So Bortles had a 10 yard gap to drop the ball in to Corey Grant. He should have done it. But that wasn't a really, really good read by Chris Jones to make a play on that ball. D4 just abusing Parnell. I mean, that was just yeah. a bad matchup. That kind of goes back to the coaching staff. We talked about on this last podcast that D Ford was their best edge rusher and that he was their best player. He graded out by far better than anybody on that defense. And you're going to leave him one-on-one with Jeremy Parnell when you know Parnell has a history of problems with fast edge rushers? Mm-hmm. Like, come on. After the first, after the second drive of the game, when D Ford sacked Bortles on the play action, you should have had a running back on that side of the field every single snap for the rest of the game. 
That's what a coaching adjustment is. Not just leaving Parnell out there on an island to get abused by the speed rusher. Yeah, I mean, to me, there was no in-game adjustment when it was clear that their defensive line was owning our offensive line, which was a bit surprising going into the game. I didn't think that would be the case. I thought, you know, they would they would make a couple plays, but I mean, man, they destroyed our offensive line for the most part. And Blake, everyone wants to throw Blake under the bus for this game, and, and we'll say it. I mean, he had a terrible game, yeah. I, I thought. he I thought he, he played did. awful. He did. But if you're going to say that about him, you have to also say that the offensive line played poorly, which they did. I mean, and you're right. Come on. Help help Parnell out a little bit. And, and going back to what you were saying earlier about that play where all the receivers went deep, you have to realize quickly, we have to start doing what other teams do to us. Three step, step drops, get the ball out quickly because our offensive line is not giving our quarterback enough time. And instead, they were running deep routes. I just, for the life of me, I do not understand why they were trying to go deep when it wasn't working. It worked twice once and what with dj charges the only time i can really remember yeah that's why he had two deep two, catches two yeah. deep catches that was it you know i just i don't know it, it I, maybe yeldon is more hurt than than we know and they're just trying to protect him but even still can we get a jet sweep maybe something like that let's let's get a little creative here have a design run for bortles he's a great running quarterback do something to run the ball if if grant goes out we get it you have to scramble a little bit but that's up to the coaches to figure out what you can do to be creative, to get other players involved. And it just didn't seem like they made any adjustments whatsoever. Ah, it was super frustrating. It's almost like I go back to the decision making. That's like what I kept coming back to. It was just bad decision making everywhere. From Blake to the to the coach, coaches, to the play calling, to the front office. If Yeldon is that hurt, why wouldn't you bring in a running back this week? I mean, unless they're absolutely in love with Brandon Wilds, but how can you be only giving him like two carries? Right. They're clearly not. They're clearly not. So why would you not bring in a running back to help you out? I mean, if Yeldon is that injured, get someone in there off the street who can at least come in and be serviceable because without Yeldon and with Grant out and I mean, we have nobody serviceable. It's just just bad, bad play calling. You know, the defense of calls. I mean, we, I mean, like, like I talked about unlucky. I mean, we sent the house on a blitz on a third and, and medium and Casey has a screen pass called up. It's like, man, like mm-hmm. what a play call. That, that's unlucky. And I liked the aggressiveness. And the Jags were way more aggressive in this game than they've been all year. I think as they saw from the Broncos game, that's the recipe to beating Mahomes was to be aggressive. Mm-hmm. And they did a good job of keeping him inside the pocket. But the Chiefs just never got behind the sticks. They were just constantly moving forward, even if it was a yard or two. They were never, they never had penalties, never had anything that was making them go backwards. And every time they did, they punted. So it's like they just kept moving forward, slowly running the ball, short passes, didn't try to do more than they could, didn't try to go deep. They just worked the middle of the field with Kelsey, worked these short routes, these quick comeback routes. And it was just like, adjust. Yeah. You got to adjust. The, the Jags D held the number one offense in the league to 23 points. I mean, if you had... If yeah, but what was it that, at halftime, though? At halftime, they had like 20 points. Right. So uh, basically at halftime, the game was over. They were just playing control of the clock at that point. Well, yeah, absolutely. But if you had gone into that game knowing, if I had told you, Jags are going to hold Kansas City's offense to 23 points, what are you? do you like our chances? I would have said yes. Yeah, but you could have asked that a different way. You could have said, if the Jags, what if the, I told you the Jags gave up 20 points in the first half to the Chiefs? Then what would you say? Well, that that's different because you don't know that what the second half is going to hold. But overall, for the final score, yeah, I'm I mean, saying okay. that, that's skewed because of the way the Chiefs played super conservative in the second half. Yeah, I don't know if they did. I didn't feel like they were ever being too conservative. To me, it felt like they were kind of like the Jags were against the Jets a couple weeks ago, where they just kept their. I, to me, I, it looked to me like they were trying to prove a point in the second half. They wanted to put up points, and they weren't. They weren't being. They weren't accomplishing that because our defense was playing well i mean again i'll i'll say it whether whether it was conservative again i don't think it was because even when they were handing the ball off they were gaining yards you know but i i i thought they were wanting to put up more points for sure and and the jags d stepped up what i didn't like and what drives me crazy still and tony romo even talked about this on the broadcast is why 
why our corners have to line up 10 yards off the line of scrimmage and then backpedal on the snap. I mean, Jalen was lined up against Tyreek Hill, who is arguably the, the fastest receiver in the NFL. And he's 10 yards off of him, and they snap the ball, and he backpedals on a, on a second and 10 or a third and 10, and sure enough, they get a first down because he's giving him so much of a cushion. But when he jammed him, I think Hill caught one pass off of Ramsey. I, I just don't understand that. I don't understand why our corners have to play so far off of these guys and give them so much of a cushion. Be physical. Ramsey is one of the strongest corners in the league. I don't understand why they're not using that more. It just it, it, it boggles my mind. It seems like every time Boye gives up a completion, when if it's third and seven, he's 10 yards off the guy. And he might only get, give the guy eight yards, but that's still a first down. I don't know. I think it drives me crazy. I think what they're trying to do is just like keep everything in front of you until the red zone and stiffen up in the red zone. Because our red zone defense is really good. We even saw it against the Chiefs. So I think they're just like playing loose, playing loose, and then play red zone bin, but don't break defense. I really think that's what they're doing. Because I think they believe the D-line is so good, they'll force sacks, they'll force turnovers. And if we don't get beat deep, then we won't get beat at all. So they're playing super conservative, and it's frustrating to watch. But if the offense is just competent halfway, the, the defense doesn't look as bad. Because we gave up a lot of field goals. We held them out of the end zone a bunch of times. It just, you know, it, the offense just did nothing to help. Defense comes up with a big interception, Tayshawn Gibson. The next play, Bortles gets strip sacked. And it's like, come on, man. You got you to help these guys out. I mean, there was one. I mean, Kelsey destroyed us. Telvin Smith had one of his worst games as a Jaguar. And he actually put a decent in the second half. But yeah. the first half was so bad that it just makes you forget about everything he did in the second half because he was just getting beat play after play, being out of position. And really, it's, it wasn't like he was... He was just making the wrong read at the snap. If, if, you're, if your read at the snap is the tight end, so you're at your... Uh, you're at your down and distance, your yardage, where you're lined up. So let's say they're five yards at the behind line of scrimmage or in front of the line of scrimmage at the snap. Your read is the tight end. So you want to read what's called a triangle, like the tight end, the running back, and the quarterback, and you kind of watch the backfield. You don't want to get your eyes caught in the backfield. And Telvin Smith keeps getting his eyes caught in the backfield. On a play action, he just flies up on the run. It's like, dude, your tight end is releasing on a route. Like That happens so many times. Barry Church was supposed to be reading the tight end on a play. It was a third and long. They just dump it off to Kelsey. He takes a terrible angle. Kelsey makes one move on church and takes the ball like 40 yards. Mm -hmm. These little mistakes you can't do against good teams. And I think the Chiefs are one of the best teams in the league. Absolutely. And, and that's something we should admit. You know, this, this loss has a totally different feel to me than the Tennessee loss. Because we have to remember, Kansas City was favored in this game. It might have only been three points. It was a home game for them. It's they were the better team. Yeah. They were the better team on Sunday, and they, they're probably the better team in general. So, yeah, we lost to them. I think if we play them again in the playoffs, we could see at least a closer game. I think we will. But it had a, total, it had a different feel to me than the Tennessee game because the Tennessee game was a home game where I'm still not convinced they're the better team. They might be in first place, and they might have our number and all that stuff, but you just can't convince me that they're the better team. They can't score on offense. That's why they lost on Sunday at Buffalo, because they can't score. They didn't score against us. Three field goals. Come on. Kansas City was the better team, and so they deserve to win. I think we, we do need to acknowledge that for this past Sunday, at least. But going back to what you were saying about the defense bending, not breaking, I get that strategy if it's the Jets, the Titans, or the Giants, but you can't play bend or break against Kansas City. You can't allow them to get in the end zone and then, or the red zone, I'm sorry, and suddenly you say, okay, now we're going to stiffen up. They're too good. If they get in the red zone, chances are they're probably going to put it in the end zone. At some point, you have to adjust. You have to adjust to your opponent. It just didn't feel like they did that. And you're right. Telvin Smith had a terrible first half. I had a buddy of mine text me saying they need to pull Telvin Smith, which you can't imagine ever saying that, right. for, which is a, rid a little ridiculous because who are you going to put in for Telvin? Right. I mean, there's no one on the bench that's better than him, but he just, that just, he was just, pointing out that, yes, he had a he had a bad first half, which he did, and I, I hate saying that about Telvin because we love him here, but, you know, they're going to have bad games, and, you know, that kind of leads me to my next big question. Can Blake be the guy? 
Can Blake be the guy to win the Jags a Super Bowl? And I, we love Blake on here. We're fans of his. Joey especially is not here tonight. And Joey was ultra, I wouldn't say defensive of Bortles, but he was definitely sticking up for him in terms of how other people on the team played and the coaching and the offensive line and all that stuff. But with the Jags down in the second half, was there ever a moment where you thought, Blake can bring these guys back? Blake can win this game. Man, that's so tough because I feel like I'm on a roller coaster with this dude. It's like we come in here after a bad game and we're like, Blake's not the guy. Then we come in here after a good game. We're like, Blake's the guy. He's just so wildly inconsistent. So I guess to answer your question is, do I think he can string together three good games in a row late in the year? I think he can. I think he can. Because he did it last year. He did. He did it last year. Now, I don't want to get too caught up in early season stuff. Because to be fair to the Jags, there's only two teams out there that really look good at this point. Now, we'll see how the Saints look tonight. They're playing tonight on Monday Night Football. They could be 4-1. and one, And they could be a team that is up there in that upper tier. But outside of Kansas City and St. Louis? Los Angeles. <laughs> outside of Kansas City and Los Angeles Rams who really is like yeah they're where I wish the Jaguars were because every team is crap in the bed right now the Eagles look terrible the Titans look terrible this last week the Patriots have been not that great this year uh, the Steelers don't look that great the Ravens just blew it all these teams that are supposed to be good are looking inconsistent it's, a, it's exactly what the NFL wants I mean, yeah. There's parity like crazy yeah. across the league right now. You do have those two super teams, though. They do look yes. really good at this point. They do. But, you know, a lot can happen. And I think that's something we should probably address as well. Like, to give this all some perspective and some context, last year at this time, do you know what the Jaguars' record was? Two and two. Three and two. Three and two. Yeah. Three and two. Three and it's the two. same exact yeah. record. You yeah. know, and it was the same exact story. Yeah. Win a big game, lose a game. Win a big game, lose a game. I mean, in, incredibly inconsistent, just like you were talking about. You know, I, listen, I, I'm with everybody. I, I'm, I'm not hitting the panic button yet, but I'm starting to wonder what the future holds for this team. Because we've talked about the window for the Jaguars being this year and maybe next year. And if that's the case, hard questions need to be asked. You know, we see this inconsistency. If, if, you, ask, if you say... I think they can do it if they get hot, specifically if Bortles gets hot. That is a big if. It's a big yeah, if. But they did show they can do it. They showed they last did. year they can do it. But the difference between last year and this year, and this is a big one, is health. I mean, we yeah. are starting to see some guys, they're dropping like flies. But, but I agree, but every team's losing players left. They are, right. you're right. I mean, there's inj injuries everywhere. But we have a team that is more dependent from a quarterback perspective on health than other teams that have Super Bowl aspirations. Okay, that's fair. You know, I mean, he Bortles needs his guys to play well for him to play well. You know, he just, the, if there's anything that kind of, if there was a switch that flipped for me and Bortles this past game was just, he's not a guy that's going to bring us back. And when there's a big deficit, I'm going to put the team on my shoulders. We're going to march down the field. I'm going to make these plays. I mean, he did that a little bit against Buffalo in the playoffs last year. It was, it was not in a typical way for a quarterback he started running the ball and honestly i would have loved to have seen that against kansas city the passing game wasn't clicking on all cylinders put it in his hands and let him run the ball let him just play backyard football but yeah and there was never a point in the second half where i'm thinking that's all right we're in this blake's gonna bring us back and that worries me that that worries me big time what worries me more is kind of the same thing but a little different i guess it's the fact that we couldn't score any points until there's three minutes left in the third quarter You've got to put points on the board. And again, I'm taking that fourth down out of it. Like, I'm cool with going for it on fourth down. I like that, actually. I like aggressiveness. Sure. I would like to see a better sequence of play calls there, but I like the fact that we went for it. Outside of that, you cannot have eight offensive drives before you score a touchdown. Against the worst defense in the NFL. The worst defense in the NFL, and they're only good players you knew were good going into the game. Mm -hmm. So you could have game-planned against them. We would have had a better shot lining up in two tight end sets, which apparently we don't do anymore. 
Last year, that's like we did it two and three tight end sets. Apparently, now we don't do that anymore. But we would have been better lining up a tight end on each side of the tackles, having them block, and just running two receivers on routes. We'd be better off because at right. least Blake would have had a chance to to throw the ball, and you wouldn't be getting tackled. You wouldn't be getting scared and skittish and deer in the headlights type Gabbert looking play where he's scared he's going to get hit. He doesn't step into the pocket. He had all kind of throws where he just does these little like weird like crow hop steps into the pocket where he doesn't really step into it because he's scared he's going to get hit. Yep. And it's like, dude, you have got to get this guy settled and give him time to throw. Line up two tight ends or line up two running backs and their only job on those plays is to block the edge rushers. The times they did that, he gave him so much time in the pocket. So have Moncrief run a curl route instead of a vertical. Like Do what he does best and I don't know. I, I really blame the coaches on this because I know the personnel the Jags have and the personnel is good. Mm-hmm. I can evaluate them to other teams and I know we do not have a worse team than how as bad as we're playing Sure, at the, against the Titans and against the Chiefs. We have talent on both sides of the ball. So eventually it comes down to the coaching. And I think we just got outcoached by Andy Reid, which in the regular season <laughs> doesn't surprise me. Right. It really doesn't. I don't know. I hope, I hope to see the coaching turn around. I love Marone. I love his aggressiveness, but he's yet to show that he can make in-game adjustments the way these elite coaches do. Is that, okay, and just to be fair, is that because of their lack of ability to do so or because they feel handcuffed having Bortles as a quarterback? You can't feel handcuffed and then say that's your guy. Not yeah. bring in competition not draft a guy late that you think would, you know, could at least vie for the job a little bit. I mean, they're all in on Bortles. So you can't be all in on this guy and then be handcuffed by him. Like we said, the throws down the field. We even talked in the last podcast. Well, I talked in the last podcast about how the Chiefs are going to probably take away that crossing route. Mm-hmm. And they're going to make us throw vertically down the field. And we couldn't. We absolutely couldn't. Right. Now, Moncrief couldn't get separation. Chark could. You know, I, I don't understand Moncrief out of, out of Moncrief. Keelan Cole and D.D. Westbrook, Moncrief has been the worst. He has the least amount of catches. He has the least amount of yards. At some point, you have to see that Shark may be a better option for what we're using him for. Right. If we're going to stretch him down the field, put Shark in. He showed last game he's better at it. I mean, yeah, but at the same time, too, we're five games in now, and Keelan Cole is MIA. You say that, but he's still having putting up better numbers than Moncrief is. He had... Yeah, I guess. He doesn't seem to have any impact in the game. He had 40 plus, you know, roughly 40 yards receiving on Sunday. And most of them were when the game was well out of hand. And it just seems to me going into this year, he was going to be the guy, you know, and it, he's not. He just, he just isn't. I don't know if Blake just isn't looking towards him or if it's because he's not getting open. But we said going in, this was going to be the guy that was going to go vertical. That's his game. And he's not, he's not doing it. I mean, 40 yards from Keelan Cole against Kansas City is not good enough, in my opinion, if, he, if he's supposed to be the guy. You know, Didi finally came out in the second half and started making an impact. And I don't know. I, th- I think wide receivers was, a, was our biggest question mark going into the year. And, it, it, you know, obviously running backs use question mark now, but that's because of health reasons. Wide receiver is a huge, huge question mark to me still. I mean, Moncrief, I don't think any of us thought, this guy's a number one receiver, but they're treating him like he needs to be. And I, I, he's not. So, like you were saying, do curl routes, do that intermediate stuff, but stop sending him on deep routes. You know, Chark finally came came alive a little bit. I I do like you were saying. I hope to see him more in that role. I mean, why not at this point? No one else is doing it. Keelan Cole two ninety five yards, Moncrief two hundred forty nine yards. T J Yeldon for reference one hundred ninety four. Not that far behind, them. right? And if you take out the Patriots game for Cole. I wonder what that, that number is. We had, we had concerns about Dante Moncrief coming into the year. So this is not surprising to me that this is happening. I kind of knew this was going to happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like we had so many, I mean, I'm glad we got Shark. Maybe they knew this was going to happen because they were going to get Shark. But you should have addressed that maybe more so than Dante Moncrief. We knew tight end was going to be an issue, especially blocking tight end. And we can see it still is an issue. And now we don't have a tight end. For the foreseeable future. We knew offensive line was a concern. Everyone wanted to draft a lineman with our first pick this year. If all the fans know this stuff, and now it's coming to fruition, how are the coaches not seeing this stuff? How are, are the coaches not seeing the fact that depth could be a concern along the offensive line? 
and you don't address an offensive lineman until the fourth round and he's not even that good. Like that we we saw this coming. We have to be better at making decisions. We have to be better at seeing where we're weak in depth and making the right calls with these guys. I get people that are whatever about Des Bryant, but bring somebody in. I don't care who are it is. Are you opposed to Des Bryant? No, not at all. I mean, at this point, what do we have to lose to that receiver position with Lee out and with Corey Grant, who was one of our best receivers, people are not really thinking about that, but he's one of our best receivers because that's where he played his game was the receiving running back role. Like, wh- wh- who are we going to throw to? We've, our receivers have shown they're inconsistent. Blake's inconsistent. At least I know for a fact on a day in and day out basis that Des Bryant will run a vertical and you can throw him a jump ball and it's 50 50 hook him down with it. Right. At least that's consistent. Yeah. And I mean, people are, I think people's main concern with him is him bringing attitude into the locker room, but man, maybe that's what the offense needs right now is, yeah. is, is, is what the defense has that swagger on that side of the ball because they're sure not playing with it at this point. I, I was, I wasn't opposed to death. I was kind of on, you know, either way, whatever at this point, is there really any excuse at all to not give him a call? There's, I don't understand. Just principle. These coaches are yeah. pretty, you know. Here's my thing. For this year, this division is winnable, but that's not always going to be the case. You know, the Colts could turn things around real quick from this year to next year. Actually, I know they're only one in four, but I like the direction the Colts are going in. I think they could, they could flip the script really quick. The Texans had a big win. At home against Dallas, you know, it wasn't the prettiest game, but a win is a win. J.J. Watt is leading the league in sacks, by the way, for those that aren't paying attention. Hey, six sacks is six sacks. I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's legit. If, if that was uh, Ngakwe right now, we'd be freaking out. Yeah. You know, so you have to... I'm just saying, like, I, I still think the Jags are going to win the division this year. But at the same time, is that your only goal? Because I think... They need to add a couple weapons, and, and you know the trade deadline sound. Let me, let me just say this: Tony Baselli came out on Ten Ten XL this morning and said that the Jags need to go after Le'Veon Bell. They need, they need to trade for him, and they need to sign him to a long term contract, which would, in essence, mean that they would be getting rid of Fournette, right? Or in some capacity. It's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> it's crazy, but is it that crazy? Yeah, it is. If there's one thing we've learned from this whole four net situation is that you don't invest a lot into a running back and signing Le'Veon Bell in order to even get Le'Veon Bell to come to Jacksonville, he'd have to sign a mega contract for more per year guaranteed than the franchise tag. So that's over 15 million a year guaranteed to a position where week to week they could be injured every single week. I mean, we have as much invested in four net, like as far as we drafted him really, really high and look where that's gotten us. You, if there's one thing we know is that you can get running backs anywhere. Alvin Kamara, the running back we just played. I can never remember that guy's name for the chiefs. Kareem hunt. These guys are like late round undrafted people. But do we have the, can we, uh, do we have the time to wait until next year's draft to try and get a guy in the second or third round? I mean, Baselli's point was this is, if you want to win the super bowl, you had better get a running back, and Le'Veon Bell will put you over the top. I think I'm, that I'm ship kind of playing, sailed. I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate here, but I, it is interesting. I will say from last week to this week now that Fournette has already been ruled out for the Cowboys game. He's not playing. Now Grant is gone. We have gone from three running backs that we were really high on to only Yeldon, who is hurt. If you had Le'Veon Bell, I mean, that, that adds a huge, huge wrinkle to the offense. I mean, he'd be, it, it would be... Unlike anything else. And the thing about Bell that's different than Fournette is he doesn't have a history of injury like Fournette does. I mean, for all we know, Fournette could come back in two weeks and re-aggravate his hamstring and he's, and he's done for the year, or at least the regular season. We don't know when he's coming back. So it's a huge question mark going forward. And with every week, we're asking now Blake to put the offense on his shoulders and win games for us, which going into the season, that was the opposite of what the narrative was. It was run the ball and let Blake manage the games. Well, that's not the case anymore. But why isn't that the case anymore? Because we don't have a running back. But that's, I, that's not a good reason because Yeldon is doing a great job. He's averaging over five yards a carry last week. It wasn't the fact that we couldn't run. It was the fact that we didn't run. The fact that it's on Blake's shoulders is not because we can't run the ball. It's because we're throwing 
deep routes three times on a, on a drive. Yeah. And if why are we getting away from the running game? We talked about last podcast. They brought in Orleans Darqua to to just kind of you know try him out and physical whatever else they do. Unless he failed his physical, why isn't he signed already? Like, what's their plan to to roll in there with Brandon Wilds and Tommy Bohannon? What happens if Yeldon gets hurt? I was thinking that last game. Like, what happens if Yeldon gets hurt? Like, yeah. Wilds, uh, what, what are they going to do? Like, are they going to Tommy Bohannon? Like, wh- who's the emergency running back at that point? You're thinking things like that. We need to be prepared for this type of stuff. And if the coaches aren't at this point, like, what are they doing? And it's not it, what if Yeldon gets hurt. It's what if he gets hurt more right. than he's already been hurt. I mean, that that guy deserves a game ball every single week. He's playing opinion. his out of his mind right he, now. He really is. I mean, and why they didn't go to him more. <laughs> We're beating a dead horse here, but you're right. I mean, I guess the upper management just feels like this team is is enough. And that's why they drafted Taven Bryan. That was a, that was a thinking ahead pick. Right. That wasn't a for this year pick. And and he's he's been good. I actually he put, I thought he played really well the snaps yeah. that he had in the game on Sunday. But that is not a pick that's going to help win the Super Bowl this year. That is a thinking about who's going to replace Calais Campbell when his contract is up or when they don't resign him or whatever. But again, if you believe your window to win the Super Bowl is this year, then they had better do something on offense, whether it's Des Bryant or Le'Veon Bell. I, I mean, I, that's pie in the sky, I agree. But it is it is an interesting you know, topic or conversation to have. I don't know. They just seem to be standing pat. And I just don't know if that's enough. I mean, Kansas City looked really good. Andy Reid in the playoffs is notoriously just a choke artist when it comes to coaching. So we'll see if that changes this year with Mahomes as the quarterback. And again, five games in is way too early to be to be hitting the panic button but i will i have to admit i feel a lot more concerned this week than i did the week before i've tried not to get too emotional about it it is very concerning but like i said there's problems all over the league i mean mm-hmm. bill o'brien is getting the same grief from his fans about his red zone his red zone play calls jason garrett punting on fourth and one and the overtime that one might be warranted <laughs> yeah, but you know what i'm saying like these yeah, guys, sure. it's happening all over the league, and we can't get caught up week to week. I think by the end of the year, all this stuff will kind of shake out, similar to how it did last year. But the injuries are concerning me, and we're going to have to make some moves at depth, or we're going to roll out there with you know, a third-string left tackle and a third-string running back with our offense. And I don't care how good your defense is, if you don't score until the fourth quarter, you're not going to win any games in the NFL. That's just the bottom line. Right. It'll be interesting if they make any moves this week as a trade deadline approaches. I don't know. I'm I'm glad for the, those that want to know, we actually thought about recording this episode the night of the Jags-Kansas City game, and I'm so glad we didn't because I would have been just saying a bunch of stupid nonsense yeah. because of Sometimes emotions were so some high. Time, yeah. you, you need to sleep on it yeah. a little bit mm-hmm. uh, for sure. And, you know, we'll see. Again, I, I think the team is going to be able to bounce back from that lost pretty quickly i think they're a pretty resilient group but this game and we'll get into it more in the next episode but this game coming up against dallas is a is a big one in terms of setting the stage for the rest of the season but again we're we're only five games in we're above 500 at three and two still in second place but a big win by the bills over tennessee thank you for that one yeah seriously not not too Surprised because, again, Tennessee, and until they start putting up numbers on offense, I mean, you want to talk about terrible offense, talk about the Titans. I mean, for real. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, they have an injured quarterback, to be fair. Yes, they do. And, but the, and that goes back to your point. Everyone's dealing with their own injuries. Right. So I will say that about Blake, man. The guy is, he's resilient. He, he, he just, even if he is hurt, which he might be, we don't know. I mean, I don't think he is, and there's been no reports about that. But in the past, he has been, and he's played through it. The guy just, got to give him credit. He is tough. He took a big hit on the chin on the second drive of the game. And that kind of concerned me because it was, it was bad. I mean, it was a crown of a helmet to his chin Mm -hmm. and which never gets called on Blake, by the way, of course not. Of course not. Can we get one roughing the passer on him? How about a holding on the, on the chiefs? I mean, I hate to harp on the refs, but when I watched the chiefs Broncos game, it was just ridiculous how much they held. I mean, when you have a scrambling quarterback, you're going to get, double the holding calls than other teams you have to it's just the way the game goes and they just i mean they had like one 
I just don't get it. There's so many holds, and Gakwe was getting held left and right. It, I, whatever. I don't want to harp on that. But there's a rumor the Jags are looking at running back David Williams from the Denver Broncos practice squad. That doesn't do anything for me. Yeah, but it's looking like uh, it might happen. Okay. So he's 6'1", 230. Pretty big boy. He's from uh, Arkansas. He was what drafted you- in the seventh round this year. That's one thing about the NFL that I think they lack is an exciting trade deadline. Most people don't even know that there is one it's in the NFL. It's early. It is, it is early, yeah. and there's just not a lot of moves in. I mean, baseball, the trade deadline is a huge date on the calendar. And don't Basketball, they make trades like after the trade deadline, too? Yeah, it's really confusing, <laughs> which we're not going to get into. But NBA, same deal. I mean, major guys are traded on the tra- at the trade deadline. I have no idea about hockey, but the NFL is just like hardly... I think last year there was some big splashes made, and that was the first time ever. Yeah. So, you know, it, I just... I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it'll be interesting to see... Again, we're tr- we're trying to be calm here and not freak out too much, but I think that you know they need a they need to add a couple bodies here. If not, you're gonna be looking at guys like Josh Walker, James O'Shaughnessy, and Brandon Wilds having to step up, and I don't know how comfortable we are with that happening. Well, you said uh, before the season started that O'Shaughnessy was gonna be the breakout player of the year. He's, he now has the opportunity. I like O'Shaughnessy. He played I well on Sunday. He, I think he's a good player. Uh, just kind of grouping him in with those other guys, but. Walker and Wilds, I mean... I thought Walker had a pretty good game. I mean, it wasn't terrible. It's hard to evaluate in my uh, that part of the game, you know? I like to be very uh, objective when I evaluate players. And when you're com- trying to play from behind and your defensive lineman is literally just pass rushing every single snap, you can evaluate it a little bit, but, I mean, how can you give him a fair evaluation? A fair evaluation is when he's playing a D lineman when you don't know what he's going to do. You don't know what scheme's coming at you. At that point in the game, they're just rushing forward, dropping everyone else, and playing just straight up football. So, I don't know. Hard to evaluate. I thought he did all right. But, you know, if he was in at the beginning of the game, he probably would have gotten beat like Wells and Parnell were. Yeah. It's better than Chris Reed. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Much better than Chris Reed. I'm, I'm glad. That. All right, so uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to shift gears and talk about some of the good things that we got from the game on Sunday against Kansas City. We want to end on a high note, make sure everyone feels a little bit better. So we'll be right back for another Jags podcast. Welcome back to another Jags podcast, episode 36. We are looking back on the game that was in Kansas City, and uh, we want to end this recap on a high note and talk about some good things, Uh, but we also want to be fair, and we understand that the Jags weren't the only ones that got things wrong on Sunday. Another Jack's podcast got some things wrong uh, as well. <laughs> on our Chiefs preview. That's right. Yeah. On our Chiefs preview, which was episode 35. So, uh, Jason, why don't you uh, read what was, I think, I believe it was tweeted yeah. to us? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Pretty good. I just, people try to like, people try to like call us out on Twitter. And I'm like, you realize that we have a section called why I'm an idiot, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> you, you, we, it's, you know, we don't take ourselves that seriously. We, we do not work for the Jaguars. Right. But this tweet was awesome. And I want to read it. This is from Jason. And he's at. J Hardy 37 and he says in the first 12 minutes of the chief's preview episode only one out of the four seemed to even respect Kansas City one person called our quarterback Pat Mahone (laughs) (laughs) we're not gonna say who it was but we laughed at that too okay (laughs) and and it it I'll give you a hint it was it's someone that's not here tonight And it wasn't Joey. <laughs> that's all we're going <laughs> to yeah, say. That's though. all we're going to say. That's all we're going to say. But we did laugh when that happened too. All right. And he goes on to say, two people said Kansas City doesn't stand a chance. Shaking my head. The flame was impressive. Another Jack's pod. And then he goes on to say, your, your linebacker Jack, Miles Jack is a beast though. No, yeah, okay. But he's right. Yeah, he is right. <laughs> he's dead right. I mean, I thought I, I was, obviously I was wrong, but I was really confident about that game. And uh, at the same time though, I have, Mahomes and Kelsey on my fantasy team and still started both of them. So, you know, I was kind of hedging my bets a little bit there, but yeah, I don't know. I just, at the same time, once they got up, I think it was 10 to nothing. uh, I was like, this game's over. We don't have it today. It was, it was, it was evident really quick. 
So yeah, we, we definitely uh, we're a little overconfident I mean, there. Yeah, I mean, but you can't really blame us because the Chiefs have a history of like folding around this time of year. Right. Like this is when they start to kind of decline and we get the Chiefs are good, but we're not we don't look at the Chiefs like a Chiefs fan looks at the Chiefs. We see Andy Reid, right. we see a new quarterback, we see our number one defense, you know, we're full of pride about them. So, you got to cut us a little bit of slack. Yeah. We were wrong, we were wrong, but you know, at least I will say this, man. Mahomes looks good. That yeah, guy. He does look good. He looks really good. I mean, I, he takes the defense, gives him. Right. I thought Ramsey played well against Hill for the most part. I mean, he gave up like a 36 yarder, but that was really it. So, yeah, we uh, we don't bat a thousand. No, absolutely you not. Know, for those that think we do, I hate to burst your bubble. His most impressive play, in my opinion, was when he, they, he had like a play action rollout on a third and short, and he hit like a fullback on the run that was like in the perfectly placed ball. I was like, dang, dude, that's a good throw right there. He's just so, I mean, he's, he has moments where he's not accurate now. Don't think he's, you know, Tom Brady, because he has moments when he's in the pocket and he has to hit a guy on the outside of the field where he's not incredibly accurate, but you know, he, he's like Tony Ramos said multiple times, he's going to be around for a while. Yeah. The dude's got talent. He had one, what was the one throw he threw to Kelsey on the sidelines where he didn't even step into it. Yeah, that's He just I was flicked his wrist and it's just like, okay, this guy's going to be good. Right, right. He, uh. And, you know, at the same time, there was some amazing offensive play calls in that game. Like you said, the where we had an all-out blitz, and they just happened to call a screen on that play. I mean, if they had called anything else, it would have been a guaranteed sack. Right. But, yeah, so... Uh, good job calling us out. Whatever that. <laughs> thanks for listening. I appreciate yeah, thanks it. For listening. His name's Jason, so he's probably Jason, pretty uh, smart. Yeah, it must be. Yeah, must be. Um, but yeah, so so let's talk really quickly about what good things happen in the game if we if we can. Okay, uh, DJ Chark. Yeah, I mean DJ Chark looked like he may take Dante Moncrief's position because everything we want Moncrief to do, Chark actually does. His l- little weakness at the beginning of the season was he couldn't seem to hold on to the ball. Doesn't seem to have that problem right now. So my biggest positive from our game, I know you've been high on him, James, but DJ Chark, I yeah. think he's here to stay. I, I, I loved it. Not only did he make the difficult catch, but he it should have been a PI on the play, which how that was not called no, was is ridiculous. beyond me. It's beyond me. You know, for these rookies, all it takes is a game like that to say, okay, I, I belong here. You know, and I, th- I have a feeling, if it was me at least, that when you're a rookie coming into this league and guys are talking and chirping in your ear all the time, it's got to be pretty hard to break through yeah. and you make a play like that all of a sudden it's like no i'm not going to listen to that noise i belong here and and i i hope that is the uh catapult for him going forward to be that guy and i i have been singing his praises for a while but he hasn't really done anything if anything he's kind of underperformed but against kansas city absolutely without a doubt he had a uh he had a nice game miles jack going back to the tweet from the guy jason he did he had a he had a play where I don't know if it was an end around or a throw to the flat, but they had a guy trying around the corner and Jack ran him down. Well, I don't know. I don't remember who it was. If it was Hill or a running back, I wish I'd studied the play more, but I was watching that going, Miles Jack's going to chase that dude down. It ended up being a three yard gain, maybe four at the most, which any other linebacker, it would have been a first down and more. But he, how he was able to get to the sideline so quick was incredible. Our defensive line played pretty well. I like the aggressiveness. I, I wish we would blitz a little bit more. We're, we seem set on just rushing four all the time, and and I get that because it works, but it was kind of fun to see more blitzes uh, in the defensive scheme. You know, Gibson had a pick. That was good. Uh, Boye had a pick. So we, we got on the board with the secondary getting some interceptions. Again, I, I've already mentioned it, but I thought Ramsey played well. It wasn't his best game, but I thought he played well for sure. And also, Niles Paul had some catches at the end. Yeah. It, it was. Yeah. It might have been a little garbage time, but you know you're high on Niles Paul and have been, and obviously with Austin Safarian Jenkins on the IR, we're going to be seeing more of him. He's he's a more athletic tight end than Jenkins. You know we you've been saying we've been saying that Jenkins is a catch and fall. I think Niles Paul can be a guy that will have some run after the catch yardage, which would be nice nice to see from our tight end position. He's had some issues like catching the ball, but he's a good blocker and he can, like you say, yards after the catch, smart player. I like Niles Paul. I liked him since his days at Washington. I just thought he didn't get enough touches at Washington. I realized he was injured, but doing some good things for us. I don't think we're going to have an issue at tight end because uh, I think we're, we're okay there. Good to see uh, Josh Walker play serviceable mm-hmm. because if we're down to our third left tackle, I mean, that's, that's worst case scenario to have your third left tackle in there. So 
if he can handle Justin Houston for a half, you know, I think we're okay there. But that's, you know, how about Logan Cook? He he punted well. Yeah. You know, I guess. He did. Sure. I think, then they work out another punter or something like that? I don't know. I think I saw that they worked out another punter this last week. So. Oh, my gosh. Really? That's who you're going to bring in to work out <laughs> as a punter? But, hey, if Logan Cook can't punt the ball, I mean, he's great at directional punting, but his distance is some left to be desired. So. Yeah. But, you know, he, he played well. So he those, those, those are the positives, I think. And, and and obviously, we've mentioned him already, but game ball, TJ Yeldon. Oh, yeah. And he had a, I thought he had a really, really good game. Would like to have seen him more involved in the offense in the first half. You know, he was the first play of the game on offense, six, or was it six yard run or eight yard run? Yeah, se- six like, or seven six yards. Or seven yards. And then the next drive, after they punted on the first drive, same exact thing. And they just kept going away from it. So. I like what Yeldon's done this year. He's certainly impressed me, and I think he's shut a lot of Jags fans' mouths by what he's done on the field, and hopefully he can be that guy going forward. But, you know, there were there were a couple highlights. It wasn't like the Tennessee game where there was literally nothing on offense you could say that was positive. That's not the case in this game. We got outcoached. We got outplayed. I think if we played again, or if we do get a chance to play them again, it'll be a different story. I'm not saying we win, but I'm saying that it'll be a lot closer than this past week i hope so yeah it has to be yeah <laughs> that it, answers, it better be <laughs> yeah or we have yeah. some serious questions to answer then as well but you know we'll, time will tell anything else you want to add about this game <sighs> do you feel worse about this game or the titans game after oh titans game okay 110 percent. yeah i agree 110 percent. yeah because I mean, we should have beaten the titans in my i mean again uh, i don't want to go back to this revisit it but you have up nine points in a game you should win that game especially yeah. at home and it's a divisional rival yeah you know that 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 hurt us more if we win that game we're four and one and we're sitting pretty yeah you know but we didn't and so it's tough i would just say don't freak out we'll be all right we've been here before we've seen this song before just let it play out these guys are professionals it's the nfl from week to week teams are up and down we see it all over the league there's like we said two teams that are constantly good right now we'll see what happens all it takes is one fluke play and your quarterback get injured and all of a sudden your whole season's changed so yeah and and look the rams almost lost to seattle so yeah i mean it wasn't like they're they're steamrolling everybody so yeah it's five games in we have 11 more games 11 that's a lot of football mm-hmm. to be played a lot of football to be played so we'll see what happens hopefully they can rebound this week as they go to dallas and I will see, but it's a big game, and we're gonna we're gonna be previewing that in episode thirty seven. So be on the lookout for that. But that wraps things up. Jason, you want to add any anything else about the Kansas City game at all? Uh, no. I apologize for not posting Twitter videos. I uh, just didn't have it in me this week. No, I understand. It would have been like negative and me like critiquing the team, and I don't know if people want to see that. Well, you know, when the sometimes when the team plays bad, the podcast performs bad. Yeah, so we all have off days. We do. We do. So that, that's going to wrap it up for episode 36. Um, Kansas City and Jaguars were, it's over. Store it away. Forget about it. And let's look forward now. We're going to be forward thinking this week. Look out for episode 37 as we preview Jags, Cowboys. We want to remind everyone to tweet us. Call us out like our friend Jason did on Twitter. We don't mind. No, we don't mind at all. We, we'll probably read it. We don't take ourselves too seriously here. We're on Twitter at Another Jags Pod. We are on Facebook and Instagram at Another Jags Podcast. Look for us on YouTube, Another Jags Podcast, and our website, anotherjagspodcast.com. That wraps it up here. They may have lost, but in our hearts, they're still number one. And as always, go Jags. <laughs>